In a follow-up to his popular piece, Why Everything is Liberal, Richard Hanania gives a deep dive analysis of how people misunderstood wokeness as a purely cultural phenomenon. Hanania also notes that it is important to understand that wokeness has been law in the United States for the last half century. Richard Hanania joins us now to discuss that piece. Welcome. Thanks for having me. There's so much in this interesting, interesting essay, just as interesting as your last essay. I want to ask if you can sort of break down, you say there are three components to wokeness, to understanding kind of the true definition of wokeness, which obviously has been expanded into this very murky term uh, that has very vague implications and that because of that has been weaponized by people on both sides. So if you could tell us what you think those three components are of, of true wokeness as you define it, that would be fantastic. Sure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you're right. Wokeness uh, it gets thrown a lot, around a lot. I think people use the term without pre precision, but I think it comes down to three things if you, you know, if you really break it down. So, there's this idea that disparities are caused by discrimination. Only, you know, disparities between whites and non-whites, or between men and women. Nobody cares about disparities between, say, Asians and whites. If Asians do better on standardized tests, but if whites do better than some group, or men do better than women on any measure, uh, discrimination is the cause. Uh, the second component is you need to restrict speech. Um, in order to protect the victimized group in question and to overcome this disparity. So you have uh, disparities are caused by discrimination, speech restriction, and then finally a full-time bureaucracy uh, in order to deal with the problem. So uh, often you'll see protesters on college campuses and one thing they'll demand is more diversity training, you know, more uh, diversity coordinators. And so the full-time bureaucracy is really uh, central to this. And what my piece argues is if you take these three components of, uh, as the three sort of the, the heart, these three things as sort of the heart of wokeness, uh, it's not simply a cultural phenomenon. People treat every institution going woke as it's an independent thing. No, this has been the law in the United States uh, since at least uh, the early 70s. Um, and so I think that, you know, my, the piece grew out of frustration with people not understanding that, especially the people who are opposed to wokeness, who sort of treat, it, uh, treat every, uh, every institution and how it behaves as a sort of an isolated case and really doesn't have any policy ideas to do, to, uh, to do anything about it when basically it, it's at its heart policy. Yes, there's a cultural component, but it's, the policy has been in the background for uh, 50, 60 years and doesn't really allow um, different kinds of institutions to develop. It's, it's uh, the way I put it is conservative views on race and gender in the workplace are somewhat illegal. And you yeah. know, if, you're, if you're worried about wokeness, the first thing you wanna do is legalize different views or different ways to have organizations. Yeah. So, Richard, you said if you're worried about wokeness, would you define that? What does it mean to be worried about wokeness? Because that's that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to figure out here, because you say it's been the law of the land for 50 to 60 years. And I assume so. Please clarify for us that you're talking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the legislation that followed that. Is that correct? Uh, n yeah, not the legislation that followed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but the way it was interpreted, which often uh, it has very little to do with the original act. And, people promised wouldn't happen. So people promised there wouldn't be anything like racial quotas. Uh, it wouldn't be an excuse to actually get, uh, to, to have race conscious policies. And just within a few years, uh, it was judges, it was courts, it was bureaucrats uh, who came up with these things. So yeah, I mean, people, it, to be worried about that means people are worried that not only is this stuff in law, but not only does it hurt, uh, does it affect free speech and does it affect uh, sort of the freedom of institutions and these other things? Um, it's also just culturally very, very unhealthy when I was growing up. Uh, you know, the idea that people would be taught um, that their race is a very important thing to them, that if, you know, if you're a woman, you have no opportunities in America or you're constantly, you know, fighting a battle against sexism. I think people are concerned about these cultural things and th these cultural things aren't all traceable to law. The law has sort of co-evolved with the, uh, the culture has sort of co-evolved with the law. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's obvious, I, you know, I don't think it's controversial to say this is, <laughs> this is something that's central to conservatism in this country, you know, what, what they're concerned about. Yeah. Yeah. And you write that it's clear that to you that the political movement devoted to fighting cancel culture, for example, Fox News coverage of Mr. Potato Head stopped <laughs> short on actual policies, I, policy ideas. Can you, can you explain yeah. that for us? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is what this is what really motivated me because it's frustrating. Because I was a uh, there was an interview with Ramesh Panerno, uh, who's a writer for National Review. He did an interview with Tom Cotton, and Tom Cotton was going on about cancel culture, and he asks him, you know, is oh, so what are you as a U.S. senator going to do about it? And Tom, he says Tom Cotton had no answer, and uh, Panerno said that there is no answer, and I, that that just that just drove me, drove me up the wall. I mean, so I mean, if you think there's no answer, you know, why are politicians talking about it, right? If if there's something that has no nothing you can do about it as a U.S. senator. Or as a presidential candidate, why does the why does this um, you know why, why does this cultural phenomenon just dominate Fox News, dominate conservative media? I don't think they have to stop talking about it. I think there are policy implications, and they're not even hard policy implications because the uh, what well, one thing the government did in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Act was that it forced affirmative action onto government contractors and the federal government. The, the colorblindness is just not an option if you want if you want to work with the federal government in any way or you want to work for the federal government, and that was just done by executive order. Trump could have woke up one morning and repealed affirmative action for the federal government, uh, for federal contractors, which is a huge, huge portion of the economy. Um, and there was never any pressure to do this. There was never any you know, uh, a realization that this could be done. I mean, he did the critical race theory executive order near the end of his presidency. Actually, these kinds of trainings, these HR, um, you know, the, the sort of HR bureaucracy grew in response to the affirmative action, uh, the disparate impact, the ideas that the uh, standards that were vague, that government forced on the private sector. And the reason you needed a full-time bureaucracy was because it was just hard to know what government would allow and what it would not allow. So if you, I have a few charts in the uh, paper, you look at the number of HR professionals in the country just skyrockets uh, from the 1950s to the 1960s uh, up until 2000 for when, for when I have data. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm uh, like many people, I, sh I share concerns with these things, but I'm also been frustrated and then people haven't looked to the obvious policy implications and things you can do. now. A few policy levers aren't going to change the culture. You know, the, the culture is, a, is this huge thing and, you know, uh, it, it's gotten some deep roots and there are true believers and they'll continue uh, no matter what. Uh, the way I put it is basically you would at least give conservatives and moderates and people concerned with wokeness a chance in the fight for institutions. You'd yeah. at least legalize colorblindness, <laughs> right? Yeah. Let's get there. And then, you could, and then you could think about changing the culture. But for now, you know, if your views are illegal, that, that's where you start. No, I think there's something really productive about at least highlighting. I mean, your essay kind of works like a logical proof, right? Because all of these um, these legal things were downstream, and they, they did come through the bureaucracy. I mean, we could talk about the Title IX bureaucracy in academia as well, which has sure. saddled universities with crazy costs and created a, a culture that is, is harmful on the campuses as well. But you, you sort of are arguing because those came through the bureaucracy, they can be reversed through the bureaucracy, which I think is a really important point. But to Tom Cotton's point and to the point you just made, so much of this, from my perspective, is so far beyond uh, the ability of the federal government to reverse. I mean, I'm just enormously skeptical that reversing affirmative action policy with government contractors in the federal workforce, as, as big as the a chunk of the economy as they do comprise, is going to, to take a, a meaningful step when we see this so ingrained in society at this point. So why, uh, w in your perspective, what would the cultural avenues, you say that could come after these sort of policy avenues, what are the cultural avenues that could uh, you know, lead to real change if, if these three steps, disparate impact, hostile work environment, and affirmative action, reversing regulations in those arenas, um, ultimately don't make a big enough dent? Yeah. So it took us 60 years to get here from the uh, Civil Rights Act, which people thought they were signing up to colorblindness, to the world we are now with just, you know, complete obsession. And, you know, even the last 10, 15 years, it's been noticeable. So changing a few laws is not going to reverse 60 years. I think what you're going to do is if you change the laws, you're going to at least create space for some different cultural and business institutions to develop and in you know maybe takes decades down the line but at least you know there would be a chance that they would be different so i'll give you an example so coinbase uh is a is a uh, is a basically a stock exchange for a for a cryptocurrency and they, the media went crazy because they didn't want politics in the workplace the new york times started writing article after article about how basically coinbase was paying uh, men and women differently and you know they, they, they didn't control for anything like like these uh, studies often do how they were uh, racist and they were sexist and this and that and so basically it put a giant 
target on its back because it wasn't showing itself to be sensitive enough on these uh, racial and gender qu questions. It's basically being threatened by the New York Times, and you know, it, it's, a, it's an open question whether lawyers and regulators uh, take it up. And so, the, you know, you, you would hope in the future that more Coinbase's would sprout up, more uh, CEOs who want to focus on, say, you know, the work and don't want to be distracted by politics. We, we see some pushback even with civil rights law as it is right now. Uh, you do see some of that. You want to give these people more breathing space. I don't think you're going to change Google. I don't think you're going to change uh, Harvard. You know, I think these institutions are what they are. Uh, but what you do is you basically create, you know, the opportunity for diversity that created different kinds of institutions. And as conservatives should know, you know, you can't micromanage the culture, know exactly how it's going to turn out, know what the unintended consequences is going to be. Uh, all you could do is say, okay, we're in, you know, when we're in power, when we're in government, what, it, what has caused things to get this way? And what can we do to fix it? And then hope something better comes along. The Coinbase example is a very good one. Yeah, Richard, I, I just want to ask before, before we end here is, you know, is it possible that there was a cultural phenomenon that existed that led to a piece of legislation to protect people and to increase diversity in the workplace and things like that, that which clearly data says wasn't happening before. And I'm unsure why dismantling all those things that has actually led to progress for people of color, led to pay equity or closer to pay equity for women, who and they're still far behind in many instances, why dismantling those systems is a fundamentally a good thing. It's been very, very good for people, both people of color entering the workplace and having more diverse opportunities in education, and women who are still paid less than men and who now are in often often cases the primary breadwinner in homes. Well, Richard, I don't think you're suggesting repealing like the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Well, I mean, yeah, it would, it, yeah. I mean, so we never tried the. So we went straight from. Um, so you, you know, people like to go back and say, okay, things were pretty bad before the Civil Rights Act. So you had the uh, Jim Crow South, and that wasn't a free market. I mean, that was government saying you can't have integrated workplaces. So we never tried. We never really tried the thing where basically you let people do what they want. We went straight from discriminating in one way to discriminating in the in the other way. Um, as far as you know, women being paid less than men, you know, I, I think that that's disputable once you control for some other things like specialization and like how many hours people work and things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't think that the, and and the, uh, you know, the other thing is these uh, gains that have been made by women and minorities, in, in many cases, they were uh, they were starting before the Civil Rights Act. So if you look at the uh, uh, the you know, black decline in poverty rate, it, it was basically the same before and after the Civil Rights Act. It, it's it's open to debate how much these things have, uh, have helped. Um, do they, in some cases, catch discrimination you wouldn't un uh, otherwise catch if you have disparate impact? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I think we've gone overbroad and, and, you know, we've, we've sort of forced this model onto every society, and sure, it, 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 the you know the, this can, this can have benefits. Um, I just think that the disparate impact has gone too far, and it's, it's basically uh, homogenized the culture and made the you know uh, I think really caused a lot of the uh, uh, you know a lot of the uh, political and sort of cultural tensions we see today by forcing every institution to be the same way. I don't think there's any evidence that we need disparate impact to treat people fairly. I mean, I, I, or or get, get to a place of equality. I mean, I just don't see the the reason to believe that. It's a really difficult conversation and a really difficult debate, so we really appreciate you, Richard, coming on to talk through it. Thank you so much for joining us, Richard. Next on Rising, The Intercept's D.C. Bureau Chief Ryan Grimm and Deputy Whip of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, Rep. Ro Khanna, join us.